with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate. On the next Supreme Court travesties, plural. Also on the program today, Democrats win in Arizona. Carrie Lake goes down to new Arizona government uh, governor Hobbs. Katie Hawks. Meanwhile, Republicans within one one seat of a majority in the House, and it's turning into Lord of Flies in the Republican caucus. Definitely here for it. Joe Biden now looking to renew the student debt repayment freeze after the latest loss in court Donald Trump to announce his third presidential run tonight supposedly you have to tune in to find out 9 p.m. highest rated show on own that's still around producer uh, prices are down in October more signs that inflation is easing and the COVID denying American front law, America frontline doctor group is in turmoil after disappearing millions of dollars. Did I get rid of my surprise surprise? I guess I did. Like They're not the frontline accountants. Years ago. Oh, there we go. Surprise, surprise. Walmart settles opioid uh, suit for $3.1 billion. Iran detaining hundreds of minors for protesting all this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Emma is uh, is out today. She's taking a couple of personal days. You know, the most stressful time is when you're moving. Um, or I guess Especially in this city, in this city, too. Yeah, it's it's rough. Um, so uh, she'll be back uh, on Thursday. Uh, Going to take a couple of days. Uh, Majority Report wardrobe coordinator on the IM uh, writes, uh, Carrie Lake, more like Carrie Cry Me a River. Am I right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Drop Lake. Yep, there you go. Uh, we got a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of stuff to get to today. We're going to be talking to uh, Mark Joseph Stern about some... Uh, Supreme Court arguments and cases that uh, we didn't get to because of the midterms. We're also going to be talking about uh, with him about the um, there are now two court cases, one in the Eighth Circuit and one with a federal judge down in Texas that have essentially frozen the uh, Biden loan forgiveness program. We'll go over these these cases. One of them involves the major questions doctrine, which is a completely made up. And we've talked about this in the past, but we're going to have to talk about it a lot more because it is a completely made up from whole cloth. Over the past nine years. Conservative legal doctrine that basically says if we think something's important enough. Based upon criteria that we're not going to tell you about then we can basically rule however we want 
I mean, it's sort of like, in in all honesty, it is like it it, it is at least in the context of my experience and what I know, it really does sound like, you know, you're living in a, a shtetl uh, in the 1800s and you got a question about, you know, like whose donkey it is. And you go see the rabbi and the rabbi just says a couple of things and then decides it's his donkey or her donkey. That's it. That's basically what's going on here. But I'll bounce that off of Mark, Mark Joseph Stern. Um, uh, but it, it, it really is... Um, Completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary. I know there's people out there who are, uh, who, who argue that there could have been a different legal authority for, uh, this thing and it's possible. And maybe the, the Biden administration will pursue that, but the amount of, uh, pretzel twisting that they have done to avoid, uh, a completely disingenuous federal bench and, 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 and let's be clear here, every single one of the people involved in this decision were appointed either by Donald Trump or George W. Bush. Uh, and, and I'm talking about the both of these decisions. Uh, we'll talk about how completely arbitrary this is. We're, we are beyond, again, we're beyond sort of rational legal authority questions and into like, I don't know. What's their favorite flavor of ice cream? Trying to guess uh, territory. We'll talk uh, about that. Uh, and the other two big stories really are one, how the midterms um, were incredibly successful based upon just sort of the historical precedent of what a, happens to a party in power at, at the midterms. Chapla joke that maybe we they were wrong about the he's not FDR thing because you have to go back to 1932. I mean, it, it really is it really is shocking. You know, like there's a couple of like sort of historical precedents. We talked about this. If Warnock wins in Georgia, which again I would uh, be willing to take that bet, it's the first time in a hundred years that the party in power has not lost an incumbent Senate seat. Never mind, picked one up. Um, in terms of what happened on the state house, we're going to talk to Aaron Kleinman tomorrow on the program about that. The and, and and also what's also fascinating about the the Democrats and depressing and fascinating uh, losing the house is that they're going to lose it in New York and California, the two places that you would imagine they wouldn't lose it. But again, I think this has to do with the politics of abortion. Um. And in some way, there is a slice of validation uh, for Natalie Schur's uh, thesis that she had back in March that it may not be the electoral powerhouse that we think because, you know, people in blue states aren't necessarily uh, in jeopardy of losing that right, or at least they don't perceive it. I, I I would say that there's maybe like maybe one quarter of that involved in this. Um, and as much as uh, uh, well, we had uh, from a semaphore on uh, Dave uh, Weigel on, he pointed out that th there is like a weird weakness in these blue state races. He was wrong about everything else, though. Uh, and I'll remind him of that. But um, be that as it may, and then and, and it is it's turning into Lord of Flies in the house. It's it's fascinating what's happening there, um, and and quite enjoyable. And make no mistake about it, it really at the end of the day they're going to come together. There are two things I feel quite confident about. One, uh, the Republicans are going to come together because that's just what they do, and they're going to spend all their time talking about Hunter Biden. Uh, and two. Um, the DeSantis bubble is very close to popping. I, 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 again, I still, I, I still think that there is a greater chance that DeSantis does not run than actually runs. Um, but we'll get to all that, but mm -hmm. here, um, we're, we're going to start with this out, uh, Kirk thing. Yeah. Okay. This is sort of a fascinating moment. It's 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 pretty short. It's the uh, Charlie Kirk show. He's got on the uh, program. Um, 
It is, uh, he's got the TPUSA chief operating officer, Tyler Bowyer. Is he the one that orders all the buses to go to DC? With <laughs> yeah, he very well may be the guy who's in charge of the buses to go to the January 6th thing. And then the one who's like in charge of scrubbing all the invoices for that after the fact. And Arizona State Senator, uh, Republican Wendy Rogers. I, mean, I remember her correctly. She's a lunatic, right? Yeah. And, um, and, but this is one of those moments where, like, it's sort of fascinating. Um, I do like it to that moment and having studied a little bit of this in college, when a Milanistic cult, they predict a day in which the world's going to end. It's going to end on, you know, Tuesday, November 15th. And then Tuesday, November 15th shows up and they have about like 15 minutes of like, hey, wait a second, what's going on? And then the leader just goes, oh, no, you know what? We forgot to carry the two. It's actually um, it's actually like April 15th, 2024. And they all go, oh, OK, good. We'll get more time to uh, get, get rid of all my possessions. Here's Charlie Kirk and uh, the crew mulling over what happened in Arizona. I'm, I'm shocked by some of these numbers, Wendy. i got to be honest. I mean, you, you know the state really well. You've been a grassroots activist for a while. The vibe on the ground was totally different than this, wasn't it? Yes. Well, we wonder now if we were in an echo chamber. Well, I mean, look, this I, is, I don't know. I'm the, just beginning to get some perspective. Look, look, I, 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 uh, well, how's that go? Let's let's check in in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that perspective is going to go away. I mean, remember Charlie Kirk on the morning of the election was yelling at about how uh, Carrie Lake was going to lose because people weren't showing up at the polls. And, you know, to be fair, a lot of people were surprised about this. Just about everybody except for John from San Antonio. Um, although, I, I think in terms of our predictions here, we did pretty good. Uh, Democrats hold the Senate and uh, lose maybe five, ten seats uh, to the Republicans. But they, you know, there really is a sense that they're in a bubble and enjoy it because this sense that they're in a bubble is going to last, I would say, probably another four days. I remember the, was it the 2014 uh, midterm elections, I think it was, or was it the 2012 where there was a Republican autopsy? I can't remember exactly. And it was about immigration. I can't remember. But I remember Sean Hannity on the air for like a week talking about how the Republican Party has to become more immigrant friendly. And then just like the second Monday showed up and that was gone. Trump's like, no, <laughs> no, we don't. Beep, beep. Sorry about that. And I, I assure you all of this, enjoy it, but it's gone. Nothing is more ephemeral than uh, Republicans introspection. Nothing. It's going to go away. That was following uh, Obama beating Romney. Uh, yeah, 2012. Yeah, Mitt Romney's callous tone toward minorities they found to be the culprit. And, right. Uh, yeah, they no. literally had a big aut autopsy. Now, they don't do that anymore because it was so embarrassing <laughs> because it was a written document that couldn't, that couldn't evaporate. And they were all like, we've got to do this. And then literally like two or three weeks later, nobody talked about it again. In this instance, they've smartened up and they're like, what we really should do is not write it down. Because then everybody has to go through all of our radio show programs and pull the audio, and that's not really cohesive. And, and so, you know, we're not going to, we'll be able to pivot back to exactly where we are. And I, and I am telling you, that's what's going to happen. And if Donald Trump does announce tonight, which we have every reason to believe he does, the Ron DeSantis talk, the we got to make a different change. Bye bye. Donald Trump is a loser. All that gone by, you know, maybe, maybe after Black Friday. It doesn't survive their family's Thanksgiving. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> what does anybody think about Ron DeSantis? Oh, shut up, dude. That Are you serious? That guy? I think he raided Trump. Yeah. 
Cynthia Lummis from Wyoming. Copycat? She, oh, Ron DeSanctimonious? Yeah, Forget that yeah. guy. Cynthia Lummis from Wyoming, she was asked about like the future of the party. She was like, I think it's Ron DeSantis. Guarantee you, you come there Thanksgiving. Her her, so, her folks in Wyoming are going to be like, you got you to take that back. Yeah, too. actually, this is what, we should do this today. as a game. Okay, we should t- somebody uh, in the Discord, uh, our, w- we should set up a uh, specifically a channel a exclusively, <laughs> exclusively for people's guesses. You put in the most adamant Donald Trump is over. We got to move on to Ron DeSantis uh, and 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 log them in. We, you know, date and time, person, so that we can go back and watch each one cool. of these drop. Yep, fall. <laughs> Who was it? Uh, was it uh, Jason Chaffetz? Was it who's that guy? Right? Was that I his name? That name? He, he was the guy who was like, "I can't in good conscience." I can't in good conscience. My daughter, I, daughter, my, my daughter. I have a teenage daughter. I couldn't possibly support Donald Trump after that. Yeah, you can. Well, it turns out yeah, you've got two weeks. Yeah, you can. Like, he's a dear friend. I'll give you two weeks, and then <laughs> and then Jason, you come back around. You get it. I'm giving you the two week grace period. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to get to, uh, Mark Joseph Stern in just a moment, um, uh, talking about these Supreme court, uh, travesties and, and federal court travesties to be fair, uh, fair as well. Oh shit. I didn't realize who is here already. Okay. Uh, we'll get to this. Um, got a new sponsor and let me do uh, just a little bit of backstory on this. Uh, for years we had a different razor that we were supporting. And then of course I stopped shaving, uh, about almost a year ago now. And uh, there's one area where I shave. It is right here. And it's not it's not very much, and I don't do it very often. Um, but don't need a subscription service. Don't want to buy, you know, uh, disposable razors. I want something that I can have, and it's not going to cost me a lot of money. One uh, purchase, and, um, and that has got a sharp blade new sponsor it is henson shaving this is really cool uh henson shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the international space station they did it for mars rover and now they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience check this out this is it it is super super simple you know, uh, uh, the biggest problem with disposable razors, in addition to their, you know, sort of, um, the they're plastic. You got to throw them out. They're not, you're not terribly uh, heavy in your hand. Sometimes um, they, the blade extends a little too far, which makes them, you know, wobble. Apparently, the way it works with the razor blades is that, like, you know, the the more uh, uh, space you give it, it's like a diving board. It gets a little bouncy. Um, that's where you have a problem. Apparently, a bad shave is not a blade problem. It's an extension problem. So they're using aerospace-grade CNC machines. I don't even know what that is, but I imagine that is like a highly, highly precise. Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches Less than the thickness of a human hair. It means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. It gets better. The razor also has, and maybe you can see this underneath here, uh, built-in channels to evacuate hair and um, shaving cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. So no more scraping uh, out uh, ra- your, your razor with your thumb, which incidentally, not great for your thumb because they're sharp, theoretically. But here's the, uh, the best part that I really, really like. Okay, so this unscrews like this, and what you do is... You place in, this is old school, you place in um, razor blades. And uh, they will sell you one for like, uh, I don't know, it's like three to five bucks per year to replace uh, the blades. Henson Shaving wants to be the best razor, not the best razor business. That means you buy it once and you're done. There's no plastic, there's no subscriptions, there's no proprietary blades, and there's no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with standard dual-edge blades to give you that old-school straight razor shave with the benefits of new-school technology. Once you own a Henson razor, 
Like I say, it's only about three to five bucks per year to replace the blades. They make aerospace stuff. They, 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 this is what they're making right here. They're giving my audience a two-year supply of blades for free. Just go to Henson Shaving, one word, dot com slash majority. That's H-E-N-S-O-N shaving.com slash majority. Add a razor and 100 pack of blades to your cart. Then enter code majority to get the blades for free. The link is in the description. Check it out. You will not be disappointed about this. Uh, no more disposables for you. No more subscriptions. That's it. One time. Bingo, bango. And right here. That's where it goes. Uh, all right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking uh, to Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate, about the upcoming Supreme Court travesties. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Uh, joining me today uh, again, welcoming back to the program. Been here many times. Mark Joseph Stern, he's a senior writer at Slate, uh, focusing on uh, the courts. And uh, uh, Mark, uh, welcome. Um, I feel like we're going to be doing this like with just such a wide range of cases over the course of the next, I don't know, maybe... I mean, God willing, we'll be doing this for the next 15, 20 years. Uh, uh, I mean, or I should say, God willing, that we'll be able to do this, but maybe we won't ha have to. Uh, if, if, uh, but, um, all right, let's let's just start with um, let's start with the affirmative action case uh, that took place now, I guess, two weeks ago, maybe, or at least the the oral arguments. These are two different cases. One is the University of North Carolina, and one is uh, Harvard. Uh, both of them, in these instances, are the defendants, and uh, they were they were brought together because some of the issues are are are, are similar. Um, and we should say KBJ had to recuse herself, I think, for the Harvard one, not the North Carolina one, uh, because she had sat on the subsidiary court that had um, had had first heard it. 
um, and before it came to the Supreme Court, as far as I recall. It's actually that she sat on some board at Harvard because she oh, had a professional okay. connection there. So she felt she had to recuse. That's the kind of ethical standard that someone like Clarence Thomas couldn't possibly understand. Uh, it really does feel like that's like, I mean, there is there's really different standards. And, and one wonders, you know, I mean, I I appreciate that she's exercising that. Maybe it does like just shame him slightly. But I doubt that. Um, <laughs> I don't think he's capable of shame. All right. Well, so let, walk us through. Like, we there has been a a long standing precedent for the existence of affirmative action, which essentially arose in the wake of uh, the civil rights fights in the in the mid '60s, where there there became an awareness that like we need diversity in, in particularly in colleges. Um, take it from there. Yeah. So on three separate occasions, the Supreme Court has held that affirmative action is legal, uh, 1978, 2003, and 2016. And on all three occasions, the court held that what you just described, diversity in the classroom, that that is a really compelling interest because students gain all kinds of good stuff from having different viewpoints, different backgrounds, different people surrounding them in a classroom. And that colleges and universities, they can't have some kind of specific racial set aside, a quota. They can't say, oh, well, you must have 15% black, 15% Hispanic, whatever. But the court said, if it's just one of many factors, if you're still undertaking a holistic review, then it's perfectly acceptable to uh, consider that when building a new student body so that everybody is exposed to people who aren't like them and they get the educational benefits that flow from that. And so it's, um, you know, we could say like uh, 10% uh, are you rural or uh, urban in terms of like where you've lived? Um, and, and, and the idea is not that you necessarily, if you're rural or you're, you're rural, you come from a rural area or urban area, you're going to necessarily, it's going to help you. It's going to be a function of how many other r rural people do we have? How many other urban people do we have? We want some type of like balance and representation. And that goes for um, a, a whole host of socioeconomic uh, factors uh, that go into that, um, which makes sense. And it also means that regardless of whether you're rural or urban or whether you're uh, Jewish or Muslim or Christian or whether you are uh, black or white, you're going to benefit from this diversity in the same way that everyone else is. This is not uh, necessarily, I mean, from the individual, it may have uh, different implications, but as a student body, everybody benefits from this. Everybody, according to previous Supreme Court decisions, according to a lot of uh, sociological data, everybody just benefits from exposure to all kinds of different backgrounds. It opens up their minds, especially young people who may have come from very homogeneous backgrounds. It's good for them in a classroom to hear from folks who had a different life experience than they did. And I think the rural urban example is a great way to kind of drain the politics from this and look at it in a more neutral way. You probably don't want to be in a classroom of exclusively urban folks who grew up in New York City, just like you. If you're in college, you want to hear from people who had different experiences before they arrived in that classroom. And the same theory applies to race and ethnicity. You don't just want to be surrounded by a bunch of white kids. You should be exposed to people of different skin colors, of different ethnic backgrounds, and, and hear from their lives and their experiences, and perhaps even open your mind to different ideas because you are forced to talk and reason with them. Um, and so we played a couple of clips, if I remember correctly, uh, from the oral arguments. One was um, a great clip that uh, from KBJ, where she was talking about uh, University of North Carolina. And, and, and what was interesting is this is ostensibly about the 14th Amendment in some ways, but the conservative justices didn't seem to address all right, will you, before we get into the specifics, will you talk about that dynamic? Because it's fascinating because they're the textualists, the originalists. These are all made up things, incidentally. I don't, I don't really buy into that, uh, the, the, those things. Uh, they are when they want to. But this is a perfect example of where they weren't even looking at the Constitution. They were looking at outcomes. And 
KBJ was looking at the Constitution in this instance. Will you just talk about that generally, and then let's we'll we'll, we'll take it down to a more granular level? Yeah. So these arguments went on for about four hours total, and it took almost two hours for the justices to actually start talking about the legal theories rather than the policy disputes here. And it was Justice Elena Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Jackson who really pushed the court in that direction. Uh, because up until that point, we had had people like Gorsuch, Alito, Roberts, Thomas complaining about all of the allegedly terrible things that affirmative action does. It reduces people to a stereotype. It you know call, it just factors them by their skin color and nothing else. I mean, you can make policy arguments for and against affirmative action, and I think have a kind of reasonable basis on both sides. Um, but that is not the Supreme Court's job. The Supreme Court's job is supposed to be to apply the Equal Protection Clause in this case and decide whether these institutions ran afoul of it. And that was not the focus of the conservative justices throughout all four hours of arguments. They were focused on airing their own grievances and hurt feelings about affirmative action and really relevant delegated the Constitution to a second or third hand consideration. Now, I, I you know, um, I, I am, I think, a little bit more amenable to the sort of like uh, the, the policy arguments on some level, just in general. Right. I'm talking generically speaking. I, you know, I, 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 I was a, a critical legal studies type of person. I mean, but but let, will you just. When you say there's a difference between policy and 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 legal arguments, will you like, in general, talk to people who don't who who don't maybe aren't clear on what that distinction is? I mean, I I am, I am somewhat I guess more sympathetic to the idea of policy things coming out that's sort of like that Brandeisian uh, brief, if you will. Like, what are the real world implications of this when we when we do it? I just happen to think that the the policy outcomes are actually good ones. Uh, they have a slightly different uh, feeling about it, but it is just odd for them who have completely built their entire legal branding on the backs of completely disregarding the idea of policy outcomes as, as, as the issue. Right. I mean, this is a long running debate throughout all of American history. What are the federal courts supposed to do? Are they supposed to apply some general sense of fairness? Are they supposed to interpret the laws in the Constitution in light of what they think is better for outcomes for the American people? Are they just supposed to apply the law as written, as originally understood? And let the chips fall where they may. So, you know, somebody like you, you'd probably say at the end of the day, this is all policy, right? At the end of the day, these justices are going to reach their preferred conclusion and then find a way to explain that on the basis of constitutional theory. And I think that is a perfectly valid argument. Um, what conservative justices have said for the last 30, 40 years is that considering policy in, in a judicial decision is off the table, that that is a totally uh, unacceptable approach to doing law because a court's role should be limited and narrow. A court should simply look at the text of the law, look at the original meaning of the constitution, apply that and move on to the next case without any consideration of how it will affect uh, the, the people of this country or of the entire world in some of these cases. Um, and so this is, I think, a really important debate to us out in a case like this because it's the conservative justices who oppose affirmative action, right? And it seems pretty clear that they oppose it on policy grounds. Yet they are the ones who have been saying for so long, policy is irrelevant to, to, to judicial decision making. We should only consider the, the public meaning of the Constitution. And in this case, if you look at the original meaning of the Equal Protection Clause, it is very difficult to identify any kind of bar against affirmative affirmative action or what we call race conscious remedies. In fact, it looks like the people who wrote the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause after the Civil War wanted to enshrine certain race conscious remedies into law to ensure that black people could be brought up to the same legal standard as white people all throughout the country. The entire impetus yeah. <laughs> to write the 14th Amendment was because they were conscious of disparities in races coming out of the end of the Civil War. And this is why we're writing this 14th Amendment, so that it will, in some ways, hopefully, slowly even the playing field on some, uh, on some like, it is, it is a function of maintaining and uh, uh, an even playing field. 
All right, and just just to just get back into that distinction between like sort of my cynicism and uh, critical legal studies uh, perspective on this and the sort of originalist textualist, there's a middle ground there, right? Uh, where most sane jurists, I think, are uh, inhabit, which is you can't, you know, like the 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 situation when the f framers wrote the Constitution was they all had slaves. So you can't literally take their intent there, or if you did, then, you know, um, there'd be second-class citizens, or at least that would be fine, Or right? I mean, like, there's no way to do what they claim to do. I, I actually think there's an even deeper problem than that, which is that if you ask a real historian, like someone with a PhD in history, whether history can provide a definitive answer to most major legal questions of the day, they would say no, that's not what history is there for. History can provide some evidence about how people felt one way or the other. History very rarely provides one single objective correct answer in any of these cases. And so in, in the in the current dispute, you can go through the record and find some members of Congress who passed the 14th Amendment who did talk about wanting a colorblind constitution. You can also find a bunch of members of Congress who said the exact opposite, who said, we need to consider race so that we can bring black people up to the level of white citizens. And you just can't find from all of those debates, one single answer that you can apply and say, this is the true constitutional meaning because history doesn't work that way. And so I, I just think a, a sane judge, someone like Elena Kagan or KPJ, they are using history and text as two tools in a broader toolkit. They are asking, what is the broader purpose of the Equal Protection Clause? What is the broader meaning of the 14th Amendment? How can we use history in context to figure out how all of this resonates in these disputes today? And I, am, I admire that kind of judging because I think it's much less arrogant. It does not rest on this notion that you can hold a seance with the framers of the 14th Amendment and learn exactly what they meant. All you can do is make your best guess about that and hopefully factor it into a broader coherent and stable jurisprudence of equality um so uh kbj at one point said in terms of like the 14th amendment like you're um if you had said to the uh, plaintiff in the uh the uh the north carolina case it seems like you might have an equal protections problem if we follow your prescription because you could have a kid who applies to unc and says five generations of my family have gone here and I want to, I want you to consider that like, you know, my relationship to the, to the university, this has been a tradition in my family and it's, it's going to bring something to the, the, the community. And it's, it's, it's why I should get in here. And then a, um, a black kid could be uh, applying and be like, well, that was not, <laughs> there's no way I could have ever been here for five generations because up until even in the fifties, there was like a, a basically an apartheid, uh, it, you know, when it came to that school. Um, and I can't, you're denying me the opportunity to bring in sort of my family story, which is like, we were fundamentally kept out of this school because of who we were. Um, and that's, so her argument was based on the 14th amendment. What were the other people arguing? Like, uh, Sam Alito was basically saying, uh, what were his, I can't even remember what it was, but it was really disturbing. Uh, I mean, I think Alito has really latched on to one of the main theories in this case, which is that affirmative action discriminates against Asian American students. And that's what John Roberts said as well. That's what the plaintiffs are arguing. I think it's notable that in these cases, there was a full trial held in the case of Harvard, a very long trial with extensive evidence produced on the record that showed that the school was not discriminating against Asian Americans, that it was not actually unfairly biased against Asian American applicants. But, you know, these justices don't really care. They think the trial didn't matter. And so they are making this kind of sideshow argument that draws us away from the real dispute to say, well, even if this could in theory be done well, it always ends up discriminating against Asian Americans. And that leads to their broader argument that these laws and these practices and programs, they flatten people on the basis of skin color, on the basis of race, that it transforms them into nothing but uh, one particular race or another, and that gives them a leg up or a leg down. And I think KBJ was 
pushing back against that by saying, actually, it's not just about which box you check on your application. A lot of these issues boil down to who you are as a person. And for black people, for Hispanic people, that may their race may have played a major role. They may want to write in their application essay about how being black has given them a lot of understanding of adversity in this country. And if the Supreme Court says that race is an unconstitutional consideration, well, then those people cannot write about that in their essay anymore, or universities cannot consider that anymore, because whiteness is invisible, and racial minorities have to go up against that and try to figure out how to express themselves without describing their race. So it's a real quandary, I think, and it just points to what's going to happen after this decision comes down. If the court outlaws boxes that you check to signify your race, that will not be the end of the affirmative action dispute. We are going to be dealing with this for many years to come because applicants will want to explain how their race plays a role in their life and their education. And judges like Clarence Thomas are going to want to say, well, you shouldn't do that. And that's unconstitutional. You know, it was Alito was talking about like, how are we going to prove that people are really black uh and he used the example of like you know what if it was he was he was he was uh you know i guess in some way he thought he was mocking uh, elizabeth warren uh by saying you know what if it's family lore that uh part of my family is uh, native american uh what 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 percentage what percentage or how far back can you go to qualify as a certain race which of course you know, my daughter's going through the college application process right now, and as far as I can tell, none of it's verified. Uh, I mean, none of it's verified. I could say that she, you know, we could have a reference from a, um, you know, a music teacher saying she is a wonderful student, and really? I mean, maybe she's not. Maybe uh, the music teacher is just uh, likes us, you know, uh, whatever it is. I mean, none of this is verified. Right. And um, the, your GPA often isn't even verified, right? You, it's. I think there's a real problem with people modifying their transcripts and sending it off. But all of this is just like a policy dispute that Did we've fallen back into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've fallen back into these policy arguments, right? About, oh, what about one drop rules? What about Elizabeth Warren pretending to be Native American? Look, that you know, that is something for the UNC Board of Regents to decide if they want to crack down on. That is not an issue that the Supreme Court of the United States should be concerned about at all um so we get a sense of of where this is going right i mean uh, we won't find out till june but it doesn't look good for at least as constructed now uh university's ability to consider race as one of a multitude of factors that they consider when they uh admit someone into their school um let's talk about uh we'll get to telvesky we've spoken about that in the past but there was an argument uh, the other day. But uh, before we get to that, um, let's talk about Bracken v. Halland. Uh, this is a case that um, is not getting a lot of attention, uh, it seems to me, in, in the sort of like, uh, 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 broadly speaking, in the media. But it really, uh, it, 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 it can seriously implicate the lives of many, many Native American children. Uh, of, of many Native people more broadly. And I, I think it's worth noting, this is a case about child adoption, right? It has drawn the attention and support of almost every major conservative corporation and law firm in the country who have all weighed in against Native people and Native families and on the side of white families who want to take these children away from their tribes and essentially assimilate them into white culture. Um, that's not a surprise because the conservative legal movement has been attacking what we call Indian law for many years now. Why? Well, Indian law protects reservations and tribes from a lot of corporate exploitation and state exploitation. Uh, it protects the states from basically seizing these children from reservations and adopting them off to white families. And it prevents states and corporations from buying or exploiting land that tribes are located on and taking natural resources like oil that are, happen to be under them. And so this is actually about a lot more than just adoption. That is kind of the entry point for a case that's really an existential threat to Indian protections more broadly. All right. And I just want, I, I want, uh, before we get into the details of this case, I want you to just sort of make this more clear is that the idea is that if certain principles can be established in this case that has to do with adoption, they can be carried over into cases that just simply have to do with uh, native rights over property. And therefore, 
you're, you're getting corporations involved in something that has really nothing to do with them on its face, but they are looking to develop principles that can then be carried over into these other cases that have to do with just, just about money and exploitation of resources. Yeah, that's exactly right. So look, the, the central argument in this case can is we that- just say, it, like, Stop here for a moment and just like, people have to understand just like how twisted and warped this is. And this is, and this is the thing, I think, you know, from a, from a, a legal perspective, like this is the way things are done. You, you know, a case that was decided 14 years ago and something written in the dicta or in the dissent by, you know, one judge can be relied upon by an entire court 15 years later to completely upend something. I mean, we sort of saw that with um, with with Dobbs in, in some respects, uh, although it was more wholesale, just whatever. We're just going to do whatever we want. But um, that's what's going on here is that the way that lawyers and the law is constructed principles that seemingly have no relationship uh, to a hypothetical case in the future end up being very important to that case. Yes, that is exactly how this works. That is why Clarence Thomas was writing about the Second Amendment in the 1990s when nobody was paying attention. And then 15 years later, the court transformed his you know, individual writings into the law of the land. Um, so look, the central argument in this case is that it is unconstitutional, a violation of equal protection for the federal government to classify people on the basis of Indian status. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. Problem number one, the Constitution itself classifies people on the basis of Indian status. This is something that is written into the Constitution. Problem number two, the Supreme Court has said for many, many years that Indian status is a political classification, not a racial classification, because what it actually asks is whether you are an enrolled member or a potentially enrolled member of an Indian tribe, which is sort of like having nationality in another country. Right. Yes, it has a corollary to race. Yes, if you're a Swiss citizen, you probably are descended from white people. People, but it is not classification on the basis of race. But because the, the court has been so hostile to Indian law over the last two years, basically since RBG died, these corporations think that they can destroy this entire body of federal law that is protecting tribes from exploitation on the basis of their Indian status. That is, for instance, tribes cannot just sell their land to corporations. States cannot seize tribal lands the way they can private land. There are all these rules and regulations that protect tribes from abuse. And one of them is, in this case, uh, it, states can't take Native children away from their tribes and adopt them off to white families. Now, the central argument in this case is that that law is unconstitutional, that classifying children on the basis of Indian status is unconstitutional. But it's not going to stop with kids, right? We all know that this is laying the groundwork for future cases that give states and, and also private companies these long uh, sought after rights to start attacking tribes more broadly. And so I wish this case got as much attention as it deserved. In some ways, it's more important than the affirmative action cases. This is about destroying an entire segment of federal law, protecting tribes and their members, and opening them up to the kind of abuse and exploitation that went on for far too long throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. So what are they looking for? The, the argument being that, um, that states can have an overriding interest or that essentially these treaties and what we've written in the context of the Constitution are... Um, they're not sacrosanct, I guess, and that they, they, there are, as long as you, once you, once you develop the principle that there are circumstances where we can supersede this, then it just becomes ultimately a negotiation as to what the circumstances are. Right. I mean, look, this is all just replaying the fight that went on in the 1820s in this country when states started seizing tribal lands and the federal government tried to stop them and states said, no, you won't, which eventually led to the Indian Removal Act. The state of Texas, which is an actual plaintiff in this case, says we don't want to have to abide by federal Indian law. We are a sovereign state and we deserve the right to control our adoption process, to regulate tribes within our borders and their members. We don't want the federal government 
government with its stupid treaties and laws and regulations to get in the way of our sovereign interests. That is exactly what the state of Georgia said in the 1820s when it started to abolish Cherokee tribal councils and seize Cherokee lands. There's nothing new under the sun here. It's just that Texas has much better lawyers today than Georgia did in the 1820s. And we should say that the the reason why Indian law is essential or that relationship is ensconced in the Constitution is because they found that under uh, the essentially the the Articles of of of, of, of Confederation that it doesn't work. <laughs> like you can't have two entities that are dealing with what is essentially another sovereign nation or a series of other sovereign nations can't have the states interfering here any more than like we can have the states saying well, we've cut a, a different treaty with Mexico or we've cut a different treaty with uh, Canada than what, you know, they've done those pencil neck geeks in Washington have done. You can't have that. Yep, that's right. I mean, so it this was... was explicitly to say states don't have authority to do this. I, I know that I just said history doesn't provide right or wrong answers, but this is one of those rare instances in which history provides what comes very close to a clear answer. Like you said, Articles of Confederation split regulations over Indians between states and the federal government doesn't work. States start seizing tribal lands. Constitution says, OK, we aren't doing that anymore. We're withdrawing this power from the states. They don't get to regulate tribal affairs. Only the federal government gets to do this. And here we are in 2022. And the state of Texas is basically arguing that the Articles of Confederation should still govern this area. Uh, let's move on. What, what, what was your sense? I mean, where, where are we with that case that, that was argued, I guess on election day, right? Is that, was it on uh, the 8th? The day after election day. Okay. So Gorsuch is really good on tribal affairs. If we only had RBG back, this case would be a slam dunk for the good guys. I think that Kavanaugh and Barrett and Roberts are uncomfortable with what the plaintiffs are asking in this case. But I also think that they are sympathetic to the white families that want to take these kids away from their tribes. I mean, look, frankly, Roberts and Barrett adopted children. They uh, feel very strongly that adoption is a positive thing and a good thing. And I don't fault them for that at all. There is some talk among the native law scholar community that that could color their view of the law here. I don't know which way this case will go. I think I think I'm skeptical there will be a maximalist decision one way or the other. I think it's very possible, though, that five justices give states this right, contra federal law, to start taking away these kids and, and adopting them out to white families. And then it's just uh, off to the races with these corporations who begin to use the principle developed that allows for that to happen for them, for these corporations to do the same thing, basically, with property. Exactly. Um. Let's talk about Telvesky. We had you on the program, I guess it was a month or two ago, to talk about Telvesky. This is a, uh, a ostensibly a case of, and, and Telvesky himself died, but his, uh, his estate is suing a uh, nursing home because they did not essentially um, follow uh, the Medicaid or uh, rules, and it is sort of mutated into whether the, um, I guess it's section 1983, is it? Uh, 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 which allows for citizens to sue for the maintenance of federal laws uh, and federal programs, essentially, if they're not being carried out by the state. We, right. we, we, you uh, smooth the rough edges off that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, you basically got it. There's this federal statute. We call it section 1983 that gives individuals a right to sue, to enforce uh, federal laws. So, you know, uh, the federal government's supposed to be doing this. The states should be helping out, but sometimes that doesn't work. And you or your estate, if you die, have to go to court and say, Hey, this law is not being followed. In this case, this horrible facility was using a, uh, awful psychotropic drugs to subdue patients. Uh, that is illegal. And so the family went to court and said, this is illegal. This cannot be permitted. Uh, our family member had a right not to be drugged to death and the state violated it. And so we are going to court to enforce that right and collect damages. And this was another instance of the conservative legal movement, specifically red state attorneys general, lying 
lining up to try to gut longstanding precedent. In this case, it's this law that lets people like you and me and our parents and our siblings and everybody who benefits from federal programs to go to court to enforce those rights. And the state of Indiana here basically said, actually, individuals do not have a right to enforce Medicare or Medicaid in federal court because that does not count as a law. It's just money, not a law. And money cannot be enforced in federal court. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that was their actual argument. And the real concern here is outside of the specific facts of this case is that this is an opportunity to um, chip away at essentially the, the deputy status, if you will, of citizens in making sure that federal law that benefits them and this could this could apply theoretically to you know um, the you know a, a whole host of safety net programs that the federal uh, government uh, provides states administer. Um, it also it seems to me could also be like you know an issue with like the EPA for instance, right? Where uh, maybe maybe the the EPA or or some uh, state organizations not upholding environmental laws. I mean, it can go across the board where where citizens have the right to help enforce the federal statutes, because if they don't do it, then who does, who can? Especially under a Republican president. I mean, this case is not as important under President Biden, who's obviously going to enforce Medicaid and Medicare rules, right? But uh, imagine a President Josh Hawley comes in and says, hey, I don't like poor people. I'm going to slash all of these Medicaid rules and let them die in hospitals. Who is going to step up and push back against that other than the individuals and the families who are suffering? And if the Supreme Court adopts the theory <clears throat> in this case, they would have no right to do so. And President Hawley could basically just destroy these federal programs without any legal pushback. Um, what was your sense in these oral arguments? I will make a rare, uh, positive and optimistic prediction. I do not think there's a majority to destroy federal program. I think that Brett Kavanaugh sounded almost offended that Indiana brought this ridiculous argument to his court. Uh, and he doesn't often sound offended, but you even heard Amy Coney Barrett kind of rolling her eyes at this. I think this will be one of those cases that the conservatives use to set the outer limits of loony legal theories uh, and say, okay, reel it in a little bit because this would just destroy a federal program that has existed for 60 plus years and do it in the most insincere and anti-textualist way you can imagine. Maybe there are two or three votes for it, possibly even four. I find it almost impossible to envision a majority of the court biting on this case. How much do you think, and and, and this may come up in, in our next conversation because I want to talk about student loans. How much do you think that this, like th they're not immune from seeing what election results are. And they're not immune from like sort of, you know, adding two plus two. Uh, and they look at the uh, implications of abortion, of their abortion ruling on this election, which I think is just the beginning of its implications, right? Because a Republican House is going to pass a ban on abortion. It, it's not going to be it's not going to be imposed because you, we've got a Democratic president. We get a Democratic uh, Senate. But they're going to try and pass an ab abortion ban, and that's going to be out there, and that's going to end up being leveraged for future uh, elections, I would imagine. Um, how much do you think that they're sensitive to the, the, what's going on in the politics? Or is it just sort of like, you know what? We, we, we broke it into the bank. We got the cash. We're, gonna run, we're, just, we're, we're in the getaway car now. We're just going for it. Chief Justice Roberts cares about the politics a whole lot. Chief Justice Roberts' vote no longer matters. I think the five justices who overturned Roe have broken into the bank, as you said, and they are just shoveling as much money into the bag as they possibly can uh, before the cops arrive. And this is an issue that we were all kind of concerned about or worried about when, when Amy Coney Barrett joined the court. Well, okay, is there going to be some political consideration of, of backlash here? Will the court at least try to maintain its legitimacy by taking incremental steps? We have our answer 
answer? The answer right. is no. They just don't care about that. Maybe there are instances where Roberts can reel them in a bit. I think this happened in the vaccine mandate case for hospitals. You saw Roberts persuade Brett Kavanaugh to uphold this mandate for hospitals, which is like the bare minimum that the Supreme Court should do. That's an instance where you can kind of see Roberts influence, but that is waning on this court. And so I just don't think that there's going to be any real limit based on politics that these five justices in the majority are going to impose on themselves. They're just going to go as long and as hard as they possibly can until there's some kind of backlash that stops them from doing it. All right, let's talk about the student loan cases. Now, about a month ago, the Eighth Circuit put a temporary stay on uh, this case. It was a case brought by, I think, six uh, Republican attorney generals who were arguing that you know, the, there was a question as whether they had standing and they had to prove that they had standing by saying um, that they had invested in some private loans and there was a conversion mechanism that ended before September, before this program kicked in, that would have uh, basically meant that their states could potentially lose money, sort of like um, a bank shot uh, loss of money, I guess you would say. Uh, under this program, which would have given them standing, and they could argue that it that it wasn't legit. Just yesterday, the Eighth uh, Court enjoined it, which made it a little bit less temporary, right? Or, or did they they halt the program? And this is not to be confused with the Texas judge, who also uh, halted the program, I guess, a week and a half ago. Um, what? What? And now I know there were two different authorities that President Biden could have theoretically done this. One was under the HEROES Act, passed in the wake of 9-11, which said that um, the Department of Education, under the auspices of the, of the presidency, could, um, could forgive debt if it was connected, important word apparently, to any type of national emergency, which would have inhibited people's ability to pay back that debt connected as opposed to concurrent with so that like you know you could argue um that was the auspices in which uh, this uh loan forgiveness happened under the heroes act um is that what made this susceptible to these challenges or was it something else I, I, these judges were always going to find a way, I think, to block this law. I mean, I think you can, or this program, and you can see that because they're concocting these ridiculous theories of standing. Uh, and you laid out one, like Missouri has this student loan processor that has the name Missouri, the word Missouri in its name. It's called like the Missouri something, something. It's not a part of the state. It's not a state agency, but the, the state of Missouri somehow persuaded the Eighth Circuit that it is and got this this preliminary injunction against the program. And the, the I think it's worth noting, this injunction, it was five pages long. The number of sentences devoted to analyzing whether this program is actually legal, zero. The Eighth Circuit devoted zero sentences to analyzing whether student loan debt relief is lawful. Instead, it spent five pages explaining how this was such a big deal that it had no choice but to put it on hold indefinitely. That is not a court that will care exactly which statute the Biden administration uses to justify student loan relief. That is a Republican court that is hungry to halt this, pro this program by any means necessary and will not even bother to justify its decisions on the basis of law because it has the power to step in and do whatever the hell it wants. In Texas, the judge used the major questions doctrine, which you've, you've talked about on this program. It is uh, a made up whole cloth in, in only existence in the past nine years. And there's no, there's no definition of what constitutes major uh, in the major questions doctrine. It really just seems to be like, when we think something's like uh, important, you know, then it is. This is going right back to law versus policy. The major questions doctrine is a policy veto over laws that conservative judges don't like. They don't like the Clean Air Act. Major questions doctrine, shoot it down. They don't like student debt relief. Major questions doctrine, shoot it down. Alina Kagan called it a get out of text free card. And I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I don't I don't really understand how any one person can decide what is major or not. I had thought that the court simply had to say whether Congress 
Congress passed this law and allowed this regulation or not. But we're in this new era, thanks to the Supreme Court's decision over the summer in West Virginia versus EPA, that gives these conservative judges a new tool to just do whatever the hell they want. And that's what this judge in North Texas did. He is a Trump appointee. He is one of the worst. He barely even pretends to be a judge much of the time. His theory of standing was even worse than Missouri's, but he still decided that this program was a major question, so it had to be authorized by Congress. He quoted some CNN article in which Nancy Pelosi said it that this, this had to be done by Congress and said, well, that's enough to prove it's a major question. Congress got to do it. They didn't, so I'm blocking this nationwide. So wait, so that has nothing to do with the authority, and we should say, in the American Rescue Act, Congress did actually say um, that you can forgive this debt, and it, it and it doesn't need to be inc it doesn't need to be subject to income tax. So Congress contemplated the forgiveness of this debt. Congress contemplated that the president had the power to do it, because why would you say, why would you why would you essentially do some of the cleanup for an act? that you think is not authorized to do in the first place, right? right? Like, why would you say debt forgiveness from the president will not be subject to income tax over the next three years if you didn't think the president had the authority to do that? Right. We call that legislative ratification, and it's a huge issue in this case. It's so obvious that Congress envisioned student debt being relieved because, as you said, it exempted student debt relief from income tax for the next four years, a time-limited period in which it clearly expected student debt to be relieved. There was a very similar issue in the, the eviction moratorium case. You remember that case when the CDC had the eviction moratorium? Congress, in one of its COVID bills, identified the CDC's eviction moratorium moratorium and actually extended it by law and said, we like this and we want the CDC to keep doing it. And yet the Supreme Court still said that Congress had never approved an eviction moratorium. So I, it's all Calvin ball here. You cannot look at the words of these laws and look at what the courts are doing and find a clear connection. You see these courts imposing their very clear policy preferences, which are debatable, reasonable people can disagree, but very little of this counts as true legal analysis. And, and most of it is just the Republican Party platform being implemented through the courts. Um, again, I, I ask this because there are some in some circles who are arguing that the Biden administration per, uh, um, purposely contemplated that the use of the authority that they're using would be shot down and that there's some other bulletproof uh, authority that they could have used if they really wanted this to happen, which is not to say that they can't they won't try because they've already made like multiple changes to this program uh, once the legal threats to it became apparent, including stopping the conversion of, of public uh, loans into or private loans into public loans and um, uh, changing, uh, you know, you can opt out of getting debt relief so that nobody was obligated to get debt relief, which was one way to, that they avoided some people having standing. So they've been doing this and they could probably find a different authority in which they would deal with it. But I don't understand, like under the major questions doctrine, how does the, th the authority in which they're doing it make any difference anyways? Right. I, I agree. And I have a different read on what's going on here. So all of these decisions so far, the two decisions have blocked mass debt relief by Biden, right? They have said, you can't issue this sweeping, all-encompassing student debt relief, this one-time program. And that leaves a lot of wiggle room for the Biden administration to adjudicate these debt relief requests on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's talk about the HEROES Act. As you said, this was passed in the wake of 9-11. Um, it is not strictly limited to 9-11. It talks about national emergencies. It defines national emergencies as whether the president has declared one. President Trump declared a COVID emergency that has not been undeclared, so it's still going on. And there is almost no way that a federal court could stop the Department of Education from looking at these applications one by one and stamping them with something that says, this person was negatively affected by COVID and we are hereby relieving their debt. There is no court order right now that stops the Biden administration from doing that at this moment. And there is no rational justification under the HEROES Act for any federal court to step in and block individualized student debt relief. So my, my read, my guess, 
is that what the Biden administration did was take this moonshot initially, say, well, we're just going to see if it works, get as many people as possible to submit their application, so gather the data, and then eventually, once this is worked out through the courts, start going person by person and relieving their debt on a case-by-case basis instead of all at once, and that'll be the end of it. Were they collecting enough data? I mean, because it, as far as I understand it, uh, Matt, wasn't it just like you put your name in and your phone number? Yeah, maybe email too. I mean, so that they reach they-, out, they have your contact information. I think it's quite possible that they reach out to you and, and ask they send you, like a one question questionnaire. Uh, a, uh, you know, w- were you harmed by COVID financially? A, yes. B, no. And if you say yeah, A, then boom, you're 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 you've qualified individually. Exactly. I mean, that's how the eviction moratorium worked. You had to sign a little piece of paper that said, if I am evicted, I will spread COVID in between the states. Like millions of people did that and did not have a problem with it. I foresee a very similar process for this. It will take a really long time. It will be very cumbersome. Some people will inevitably fall through the cracks, but there's just no way that a federal court can tell the federal government that it cannot discharge this debt that it holds. You know, the federal government is holding this debt. It gets to decide what to do with this debt. And if it has to go through person by person rather than all at once, I think that's something that the Department of Education is ready to do. And let's be clear, if they were to do that, what what capacity would the federal government have, I should say, what ability would the federal government have to do anything in terms of its books? I mean, like, how do you justify raising taxes? How do you justify, how do you justify doing anything? Right. And I mean, the HEROES Act makes it very clear that you can discharge debt. Now, the question is whether you can do it on a mass scale. Courts are going to rewrite the law to say no. But as you said, there's all kinds of other laws, like thousands of them, that give different federal agencies the ability to uh, manipulate monetary funds that are held by the federal government. And if federal courts intervene here, there's no logical limit to where they'll they'll stop. They're just going to keep doing this. I don't think that the Supreme Court wants to spend the rest of its time on this planet adjudicating every penny of federal money that is spent or relieved or canceled. So I I just don't see a way around this for even the most radical federal judges. All right. And so when, when do you anticipate this getting up to the Supreme court? We don't yet know. In its current form. In its current form. I don't know if the Supreme, if the Department of Justice will appeal the Eighth Circuit's preliminary injunction to the Supreme Court. Maybe it will. I could understand political considerations. If I were a DOJ, I would think very carefully about working this out in the lower courts while you're still collecting all of this data from individuals, encouraging people to submit applications, go to trial in the lower court. They've stopped it. My understanding is they've stopped the applications as of uh, a good day or two ago. Okay, they didn't stop it initially. I guess they've stopped right. it. I think recently. they stopped it. I, th- I think they stopped it uh, in the wake of the of the Texas uh, rule. Well, they should continue because that is the information that they're going to use if they're going to get anything done here. Uh, but I think there's a good chance that the Eighth Circuit decision will get appealed to the Supreme Court, and we'll get a decision on the shadow docket sometime before New Year's. Okay, and all right. So lastly, let me ask you one other question: uh, the investigation on the leak. The um, the last we heard, um, Alito said it was a betrayal, and it was a very open ended saying of it was a betrayal. It was a question asked at the Heritage Foundation, which, in my opinion, and you know maybe it's a function of my conspiracy addled mind, was a question that he invited. The, you know it wasn't. You know, I, I get the sense that uh, Alito doesn't go to the Heritage Foundation and they ask him surprise questions. Um, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but I find it very, very hard to believe that a Supreme Court justice is going to the Heritage Foundation and they're, you know, springing questions on this guy uh, in, in a public forum. And so he clearly wanted to address it. He referred to it as a betrayal, um, which to me, this was my take. I'm curious as to yours is his way of saying this was this was done to me. Like we, and because he went on to say, like, we got death threats because of it, uh, ignoring the fact that Sonia Sotomayor had a death threat, you know, a year before, ignoring that, like, 15 years ago, John Cornyn, was it, uh, was on the, uh, the, the Senate floor going, like, I can understand why people want to attack federal judges, um, you know, because of their rulings. Um, he made it like, it sounded to me like he was setting up a narrative where they were as victimized by this as, 
the uh, as anybody else, which I find to be a little bit rich uh, because it ultimately probably locked in maybe a couple of votes that were wavering. At least that, in my estimation, was the agenda. What's your sense of that? And have you heard anything in terms of like when the timing might come? Uh, only what you have heard. I do not think we will ever get a definitive result of this leak investigation. I think it's a lot of theater. I think that they're going through the motions. I don't think they will find an answer. And further, I agree with your speculation that this is more likely than not a leak from conservative chambers that were designed to lock in Brett Kavanaugh's vote with the majority. I mean, remember, a week before the draft came out, the Wall Street Journal clearly got a leak and wrote a whole editorial saying Brett Kavanaugh shouldn't waver and still should stick with you know the the maximalist decision rather than going over to John Roberts compromise. So I, I just think the whole thing is ridiculous. I doubt we'll ever get an answer. People like Alito will use it to justify their endless grievances. The rest of us will probably forget. I don't think it will become a normal thing that happens all the time. I think this was a, a one-time only thing in a very major case. And we'll never really know. And that will allow Alito and Thomas and all of those conservatives to continue to act like they are the real victims of the Dobbs decision. I will never forget. I'm going to talk about this ad nauseum until like the entire audience has passed on and uh, they have no idea what I'm referring to but that's what's going to happen around here. Uh, Mark Joseph Stern, thank you so much. Uh, senior writer at Slate.com. We'll put a link to all of your writings so that people can further understand these things. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon for the next round of, uh, of, of really disturbing decisions that will be coming down from this court. I, I would say I look forward to it, but I frankly don't. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Believe me. I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, folks. Uh, this is going to be like this investigation. I don't know. Uh, Matt remembers this. It was um, the Janus case. And I can't remember the one that came before it. That was um, about to be decided. And then uh, Sc uh, Scalia dies. And it wasn't the Janus case at that time. I can't remember the name of it. Um, it was a different case. Bringing up the same issues as to whether... Um, public sector unions had a right to charge an agency fee, not dues necessarily, but an agency fee because you're in a uh, union shop and everybody gets their compensation negotiated by union lawyers. Agency fee just basically pays for those representation uh, directly. There's no other unions. And um, we had basically... Do you remember that year, Matt? We, I think we we did about, I don't know, 20% of the shows were on those two cases. One a week. Yeah. And uh, that was basically the only thing. Show did much better the following year, actually, in terms of audience for some odd reason. But I was, um, I was, I, I, I basically made a, a public choice. And that was, I don't care if there's only four people listening to this program by the end of the year, those four people will understand this case and the import of it. Um, and then uh, Scalia dies and then, and then everything else happens. And then we're, we're, Janice happens. Epic Systems v. Lewis? That does not sound okay. right. Nope. I'm just looking at something. It was a, it was a precursor <laughs> to the Janus case. I can't remember what it was, but uh, somebody will do it. Um, all right. Uh, folks, we're going to head into the fun half of the program. We will take your phone calls and your IMs. 646-257-3920 is the number. Now, the phones are not up yet, but they will be soon. A couple of things I want to make, uh, make you aware of. The app right now is going through a redesign. I've taken a look at a beta version of it, and I'll tell you something. It is sweet. Um, it is super easy to use. Check that out. Check that out. Look at that. Oh. It is so pretty. It is so easy to use. And it allows you to listen live. It allows you to IM the show. It allows you to call the show. It allows you to watch the YouTubes. It allows you to search. Um, I don't know. Give me a search tag. Matt. Oh, um, uh, man, a uh, Janice. That's Janet. probably too specific. You know what? I don't know if we've gone back that far actually yet. Uh, but let's see. 
Janice. Oh, oh here we go. Oh, there it is. Oh, awesome. Uh, we got the final day Barrett hearings. Uh, we got the state of race expensive state house contest with Dave Weigel. I'm not sure why Janice came up in that. Uh, the teachers union, Randy Weingarten, that must have come up. Crunch time and Kavanaugh fight, that must have come up. Apocalypse organizing post Janice with Ian Mealheiser and Jane mm. McAlevey. West Virginia teachers, how Parkland is different. Remembering Barry Crimmins. Janice and the potential destruction of public sector unions. And Murphy Oil and what Me Too can teach the labor movement with Jane McAlevey. So Janice came up a bunch there, and that goes back to 2018. Wow. Um, and that's what you can do on this app. Uh, it's going to be updated soon, but go get it now. You can I am the show. You got to be a member to I am the show. At least you will be. You can call the show. You can get to our 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 our, our blog, and you can sign up for the AM Quickie, which is our newsletter. We have over like I think. I don't know how many people on that list, but uh, we get about anywhere from like six to 10,000 people a day reading uh, that newsletter. And uh, you can go there, amquickie.com. It is free for now. Uh, we may in the future soon do like a, some type of freemium model, but check that out as well. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. The new app does look sweet. Thank you. Uh, you can pick up the old app at majorityapp.com. And then when it updates, the iOS update will come out first, then the Android update will come out after that. Um, and uh, also, don't forget, it is your support that makes this show possible. We get The app is free. Um, if you want the free half for free, without free of ads, become a member. Join the majority report.com. Uh, you will help the show survive and thrive. Emma uh, had ESVN. What was happening on ESVN yesterday, Bradley? Um, so we did a week 10 recap of the NFL action. And then also we had uh, uh, Nando Vila of the Exile Content Studio uh, to preview the World Cup group stages coming up in the next few weeks. And also he's uh, debuting a new uh, soccer podcast today to recap. Uh, that's a kind of a flashback to some iconic and special World Cup, uh, previous World Cup uh, memories. Someone described um, uh, being a fan of, well, maybe not so much the World Cup, but uh, like uh, British football slash soccer as a good excuse to get up at 8 a.m. and go to a bar. I, I think, it's, and especially because they they have kind of like, uh, you know, Sisyphean struggle to like, they have such they have such diehard fans, but have had not had a lot of success recently. Also, the I time think, difference. Yes, I imagine the the bar, well, the, time the bar, and the time that's difference. That's what I'm saying. Is, You're going to a bar at eight in the morning. A few more drinks. <laughs> um, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckin Media Universe? Do you not like that? Uh, I, it just sounds too much like the uh, Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe. Yeah, well, it's like it's sort of like a little play on words. You I don't want, like you want those something things. Different? No, I'm I'm too cool for uh, comic books. But uh, you know, me and Alan well, Moore. I, th I think spelled out, it's fine. We don't we don't have to go with the M <laughs> the M L U. <laughs> All right, well, I'll come up with something else then. God, um, you you could have mentioned it to me. I've been doing it for like three <laughs> years that way. I know. I, I, it, you, you, like it came up yesterday. You're like, ugh, I hate that. Well, you didn't ever really call it the MLU before that, and it just made it too real. All right. Um, but uh, tonight on the Back MLU, the dry, dry um, board. <laughs> Left Reckoning, uh, got a jam-packed show tonight. Uh, we'll have Nick from the Debt Collective talking about the student loan stuff, and uh, Ryan Zickraff talking about some submerged labor history in Tennessee. Uh, so that's patreon.com slash left reckoning. We'll talk Elon in the post game a little bit, too. Um, so patreon.com slash left reckoning. I'm curious what they say about the debt. I mean, I think there's definitely other avenues for the Biden administration to pursue, but the idea that they came up with this, they pursued it in this way so that it would purposely be shot down is just like wishful thinking by people who don't appreciate the importance of the courts. And well, yeah, I want to obscure to that it's Republican judges. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Republican judges who were there because uh, because Donald Trump was elected. Why did Biden put all those judges there? I mean, the, the, it, it really, oh, Jesus. It, it just gets my goat. <laughs> and that and having to come up with a whole new freaking, you know, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe. I'm going to have to deal with that now. Folks, see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. well, who sent us this? Oh, yeah.
Alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a, whoa, what a, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! Can we bring back DJ Dennis? Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Dennis. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break time. <laughs>